a couple of decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Spirit of God inspired the Apostle Paul to pen the words that we're going to read today from Philippians chapter 2. The words, it seems here, were probably the, the content of what was an early hymn sung by the Christian church. You know, hymns that we sing in church, historic hymns especially, have, have this way, don't they, of embedding the most important truths of our faith in the minds and hearts of each generation, passed down as the gathered church of God celebrates and sings those hymns to each other. And so certainly in what we're going to see today, we're going to read some very deep, profound truths, some things that we want to think about and ponder and take home and mull over and chew on and pass down because they're so vitally important to our faith, because they're truths about our Savior Jesus, the Savior that we need. And so today we're going to read these words here from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's pretty epic, isn't it? Make a good hymn. But it makes me think about a question. My question for you today is, what would you do if you were God? There's a movie about that. Uh, it's a movie that came out about 20 years ago or so, right about the time I was graduated from college. Man, the time flies. It's in the uh, fantasy comedy genre. Anybody's favorite subgenre there? Fantasy comedy. It's uh, a movie starring the actor Jim Carrey. He's still at it. A little bit older now, Jim Carrey making people laugh. It's a movie about how God, the Almighty, gives the character played by Jim Carrey, his, whose name is Bruce, almighty power is God. He, he basically lets Bruce, who's a TV reporter, get to play God for a week. The movie's called Bruce Almighty. Anybody seen it? I'm not saying you should, but oh, a bunch of you have. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So what, what do you think Bruce does? Power is God. Well, you know, he does what you'd expect at first. He, he goes about improving his life. Right? Bammo! Woo! All right, my life is better. Woo, this is fun. Right? And then he goes about doing the next thing you might expect, going about getting revenge on all those mean people out there, all those people who've mistreated him in life. He gets revenge on this gang that had been kind of treating him badly. He gets revenge on, on the guy, his co-worker, who got promoted over him to be the news anchor on national TV. He just kind of like trashes this guy's reputation on national TV. And then, then Bruce uses his, his powers to get his job back. And all the while, he just seems totally unconcerned for the well-being of other people, including his girlfriend. Right, not a good move, Bruce, right? But then he, uh, he eventually tries to answer everybody's prayers. This is maybe the funniest part of the movie. He's, he's getting bombarded by all these prayers, and it's overwhelming, the prayers of everybody around the world all the time. So what does he do? He, he just goes, yes, 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 yes. He gives everybody everything they want. He answers everybody's prayer with a yes. And can you guess what happens? Total chaos ensues around the world. There are world riots and all 
crazy things happen. Everybody getting what they want? Turns out that might not be such a good idea. Well, finally, by, by the end of the movie, you know, there is kind of a happy ending, if you will. Bruce finally learns being God's a hard job, and, and maybe he's not cut out for it, but he could do a better job of actually caring for other people besides himself, you know. But it makes you think, just like I, I kind of think Philippians 2 does a bit, like if you were God, what, what would you do? I don't know, this is a little bit of an aside, but I think that's kind of what makes video games so much fun these days, right? Sandbox games where you go in creative mode. You can build anything you want, make anything you want. If you can dream it, you can do it. And so many games, right? It's kind of a way to feel empowered in a world where you, you can't control much. You're told to stay in your home and all this stuff. Like, you have no power. What can you do? But you can. There's actually a setting on a lot of video games, the highest level of setting. What, what do they call that? God mode, <laughs> yeah. Or in some video games, there's, there's a computer game I like to play called Civilization, and the highest difficulty level is deity. Deity. Which, it kind of makes you want to try, right? What would you do if you were God? Would you try and solve all the world's problems? Would you put an end to COVID? Would you eliminate poverty and hunger? Would you put down a guy like Vladimir Putin and put him in his place and, and cause all wars to cease? Because it kind of sounds great in theory, doesn't it? Getting to be God. And I have no doubt that our sanctified selves with God's spirit might, might do an okay job of that once in a while. But do you think that if everybody everywhere was given almighty power as God, do you think we'd be able to solve all the world's problems? Or do you think that perhaps, in fact, we might, humanity, end up causing more? Right? Because I think this, this is probably, probably true, that every, in some sense, every election is, is evidence, at least of this, that human beings, we haven't yet figured out how to agree on all the solutions because we're never going to be able to agree on even what the actual problems are. And yet every single, every single election, every single place, anywhere, it's always, well, here's this person, here's this party, here's this platform, and if we just get this and do this, then behold, peace and prosperity and justice for all, except, do you really think? That's going to happen here. I, I think when the Bible talks about the deep, deep part of every human being, it's, it's just being honest with the world that we live in, that there is this part of us deep, deep down, this, this part that is just inherently bent towards what we want for ourselves. There's this part of us, this sin nature, the Bible calls it, that's inherited, passed down from one generation to the next. And the thing about this sinful nature that we all have is that it really doesn't want to let anybody or anything ultimately get in the way of its own happiness, its own comfort, and what it wants. I think, I, I think you know this to be true, too, because you have a sinful nature in your own heart, I, I I do too. It's what makes it so hard, even when you are at your, your selfless best. You know what I mean? When you're trying to do something because you know it's the right thing to do, and it's like out of the, you call it the goodness of your heart, you do this thing. But how often isn't it just even a little bit or more tainted with this kind of selfish idea, really, that, well, I'm doing this, yeah, because I'm trying to be kind and good, but I really hope to get something out of it, some recognition, at least a thank you note, if not something more. It's true in marriage a lot of times, isn't it? If you're married, how often don't you maybe go the extra mile once in a while because you're hoping to do this thing that, well, maybe if I do this, then that love and affection and generosity will come back around in some way. Or if you're dating, right, and you're working really hard because, you know, there's, there's still not that promise yet, so you're, you're working hard, and that, that's, a, that's a good thing, you know, to be on your best behavior. But isn't there that part of you that, 
is going an extra mile because you hope in some way to get something out of that, right? What you want. And how long would you really keep loving and serving and giving and if you knew you weren't going to get anything out of it in return? The Bible tells us that we are so corrupt to the core like this that it's, it's almost hard to imagine a human being that you would trust with God's powers, isn't it? Like somebody who would always do the right thing, the selfless thing, and never look to get anything out of it for themselves at all. One more little aside. I think this is why in the history of the world, every man-made religion, so I'm not talking about True religion. Every man made religion anywhere in any culture has always kind of invented gods or goddesses that are very suspiciously just like selfish human beings. The, the gods of Roman and Greek mythology, for example, they're given to the same kind of vices and, and heart issues that human beings are. They're, they're capricious and vengeful, and they just kind of like enjoy messing around with people. And these are the gods to worship. I, I read in, uh, in, in ancient Mayan ruins, like at Chichen Itza. Let's put that picture up on the screen. Anybody been to Chichen Itza? Anybody here? No, but a couple people in Saturday service were. No? Okay. Well, maybe when you go, you, you can... Notice things like this. There, this is right there, and there's this, this is the statue of this god who's called Chakmul. And it's kind of goofy looking, right? You look at, like, what's going on there? He's, he's got, like, this platter on his belly. You're like, well, what's the deal there? Well, that, that platter is, that's the place where he's demanding that you place a live, beating human heart. Or else the sun is not going to come up in the spring, right? Like, that's, that's the idea. He's this mean, greedy God who demands this great sacrifice just so that you can kind of continue to eke out a life or an existence here. And, you know, that's not that strange in the sense that all across human history and every culture where human beings have invented religion, they've invented gods that are suspiciously just as selfish as, you, as human beings are. And it kind of shows you, doesn't it, like every human attempt to play God always is going to end up badly for human beings. And that goes all the way back to the very first human beings in the Bible that we read about in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve, who were made by God in his image to love and to worship God. But we find out they weren't content to love and to worship God. They wanted to be equal to God. In fact, worshipped as gods. And then look at all the mess that that brought into our world. Okay, so all that, friends, is to bring us to this point today where we can start to make sense of the words that the Apostle Paul gives us today, which is to say all that is how human gods are because they reflect our selfish human heart. But then, but then we learn about Jesus. And we learn that Jesus was equal to God because he was and is still God. Which means that Jesus can do anything effortlessly. He can be anywhere simultaneously. He knows everything instantly. He, he's smarter and a whole lot more powerful than Google. As ever present as they are, they're probably listening right now. Jesus is smarter and stronger because he's God. The Lord Almighty always was, always is, always will be. And yet, here's what the Bible tells us. We read this verse, verse 6. It says about Jesus, who, being in very nature God... That's who he is in by nature, essence. He is God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Does that not boggle your mind? Can you think of anybody else for whom that would be true? I mean, we can think to ourselves, man, it'd be kind of fun to play God. 
It was fun on a video game. It'd be more fun in real life. Just think of what I could do, all the fun I could have. Right? But yet Jesus, who was God, who is God, he didn't use his power as God for his own selfish interests. Like, he's not like some big tech company, right, who uses their power to be able to kind of try and know everything about you so that he can exploit you and your data and then sell it and make a profit, and then it can be all about him. This is not like what we call now surveillance capitalism. This is not Jesus. This is not the Lord God Almighty. He did not use his power for his own profit, but we're, we're told in verse 7, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Right? So just think, the, the creator of all, who owns it all, he made himself nothing. He took on, the, the sovereign Lord of the universe took on the, the very nature of a, a servant. Literally, it's, it says a slave. Like, who does that? The infinite God became a finite being just like us. The creator of all allowed himself to be conceived inside the womb of a young, poor, peasant Jewish girl named Mary. And he spent his first night in this world, not in some ritzy, you know, Carlton Hotel, not some Hilton, but a little manger, a feed box, a place that animals, stinky, dirty farm animals would, would eat their food. He, he slept there that first night, and who knows for how long. There was no room for him in the end. The world had no room for God who came so near, too busy. And as he grew up, Jesus, he, he had no place to lay his head, no place to call his own. He allowed a group of women, really, to finance his ministry as he gathered a group of disciples and went around doing good and loving people and, and teaching people. But we look at it and we see Jesus in the Bible and we watch him go around, we see him interact and he, he got hungry, thirsty, tired, he, he slept, he, he wept. We heard that in our reading just before. He, he's so human. Jesus, though God, he, he kept his powers as God, his full and frequent use of his powers as God, maybe we should say. He kept that for a time under wraps. He didn't get rid of it altogether, but he kept it under wraps. He would not use his power as God for his own selfish, sinful advantage. Now, to be sure, Jesus did do miracles on occasion, right? In fact, let's just bring up one. one. One time, Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're going along through the countryside, you know, and they go, they go past this small town. It was, it was called Nain. You know, and how it is in small towns, everybody knows everybody. It's a big support group. Some of you grew up in a small town. You know what that's like. So the whole town is coming outside of, of the town. They're on a procession as Jesus and his disciples are passing by. It's a funeral procession. There's a little coffin at the front, a, a, a small boy, the only child of, of a mother who was a widow, and here's her son. The whole town is out mourning along with her, and Jesus, he's grieved in heart. He, he sees the, the wreckage of death in this world. This is not the way things are supposed to be. He knows he's come to do something about it, some bigger picture. This mission that he's on, he goes and grieved in heart, he goes and he, he raises up this dead boy and he, he gives him back to his mother. And then the whole town is just astonished. And so the good news spreads like wildfire across the countryside. People say, God has come! God has come to help his people, they say. Jesus, we see, was always and fully God. But he never used his powers as God for his own selfish advantage. It's really interesting. You know, sometimes, in fact, uh, Jesus, when he did something miraculous, what did he tell people? He, he said, don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> you know, you ever read that? You're like, what? 
That's not how to, that's not how to launch a political campaign, Jesus. No, we got to go to Twitter. We got to put this on Instagram. Like, we got to get you a marketing team. Like, you're terrible at this, Jesus. You need more followers. No, Jesus knows there's going to be a time when he's going to say, you know, go and tell and make disciples and everything. But this is not yet the time because he didn't want anybody coming to him for the wrong reason. He didn't want anybody, especially coming to him, trying to dissuade him from what he knew he had to do, which is to go to that looming cross in the distance. That was the way, the only way to win the victory over our greatest enemies, to solve our greatest problem. No entitlement program, no earthly thing could ever just be better than what Jesus knew awaited at the end. But he had to go there. He had to complete it. He had to cry out, it is finished, before he could say, go and tell, or else people would never come to him as the Savior that they really need. Because just like the people in Jesus' day, we would be so blind. And to think instead, we, we want a Savior who is going to give us cheap earthly things instead. But Jesus didn't want anybody coming to him, you know, like he was just some run-of-the-mill man-made deity. Like, you make a great sacrifice, and I'll give you some cheap little earthly pleasure for a little bit. Then you make some more bigger, and I'll give you a little bit more. And if I decide to, I'll just, like, zap you. and blah. Right? Or like some genie in a bottle, you know, rub the lamp, give me my wishes, I'm going to wish for more wishes, and you're going to do that for me, right? Ha ha. Jesus didn't come to be like that. He came determined to be the Savior that we needed. And what we see and what we hear in this hymn of praise to Jesus is that he is both true God and truly human. The only one uniquely qualified to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And in order for him to rule us, to rule us as our righteous king and to bring us to heavenly glory one day, we first needed him to suffer and die here in our place. Before his exaltation to the right hand of the Father in heaven, and along with him, ours as well, we needed him first to be humiliated into death, to suffer the punishment of hell on the cross in our place. And that's why we have to also read verse 8, which says, And as being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, this is meant to be shocking. If you, walked, if you drove here down 58th Street today and it was lined with crosses of people being crucified, this would be more shocking than it is to us in our world today where we put a cross up on, the, on our, our logo. And, like, the cross is meaningful. I'm, don't get me wrong, but it, it is, first of all, scandalous and shocking. Because death by crucifixion was one of the most horrific things ever designed by human, human beings in our depravity. Not only to cause the most excruciating pain, but to completely humiliate and degrade a victim. And I won't get into all the details, but death by crucifixion was, by design, horribly painful and utterly degrading. Death by crucifixion would take hours, usually days. So let's, let's talk about Palm Sunday then, the day that kind of begins the final journey of Jesus that's going to that cross, that looming cross that he knew was there from the moment he was born, inching closer every day until that Friday came. On Palm Sunday, Jesus, he, he's riding into Jerusalem, and the crowds are shouting, Hosanna, save us. But what are they thinking? They, here he comes. He's, Hosanna, save us. But he's not... He's not leading a, an army. He's not on a war chariot with white stallions all decked out. He's not leading a bunch of tanks rolling into the city. He's no military conqueror like that. He's humble and lowly. He's riding on a donkey. He's not like some dictator who's like got all the jackbooted soldiers going ahead of him, rolling in. He's, he's not like some corrupt oligarch who's trying to hold on to keeping his, his yacht from being seized or something like that. He's a humble, lowly servant. 
yet he's the savior and or he's the creator and owner of it all. Who would be willing to allow his corrupt creatures to turn on him, to arrest him, to beat him, to mock him, to cast him aside, to murder him on a cross, and then to discard him like a piece of garbage? Who, in love, what God would so humble himself, sinless and holy, to die such a death at the hands of unjust sinners like us? Selfish in our hearts. Like, would you not expect, right, Jesus, to avoid that, to avoid the pain, to avoid the humiliation? Wouldn't you expect him to avoid the cross? We're just so familiar with corrupt people in our world, corrupt leaders, people who use their power and use it to exploit and to harm and to hurt and somehow try and justify it as if it's a righteous cause or as if it's anything but what it truly is, a greedy power play where they disregard the value and dignity of anybody else but themselves. Those are the gods human beings appoint and anoint and and imagine and create. And yet Jesus, he's he's no corrupt earthly leader. He's no man-made Messiah who's going to be sure to let us down. But friends, here in Jesus is the humble servant of the Lord who in love was willing to come to be the savior of the world and to be sunk down into the deepest, darkest depths of suffering and woe, enduring our hell. So that by his grace, just as he too is exalted one day, we might also along with him experience and taste the joys and the pleasures of heaven through no merit of our own, but completely and freely because of his amazing love that he would lift us up. And to do that would himself be sunk down so, so low. Who is Jesus? Who is this Savior? He's he's the one we truly need. Someone to rule us in righteousness, in his heavenly glory. And our human nature, even exalted in him, he still... Fully human, God and man, this mystery that even the angels long to understand and which is to his praise and glory that one day we too, as he comes back, true God and true man will one day raise us up, glorify us to be with him in that place where there will be no more suffering, no more corruption, no more brutality, no more war and Nothing will ever hinder our permanent joy. That is the paradise that Jesus came to give. No cheap, chintzy, earthly things. No car, no money, no uninterrupted prosperity here, but a perfect peace, a permanent joy in heaven. And so let us hear, and let us now, until that day, lift up our hearts and voices in praise of the only name that saves. The crucified risen and ascended one, the only name that saves, the only Savior that we have, and the only one that we need, whose name is Jesus the Christ. He is the Lord. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And all God's people said, Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all our understanding guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus until he comes back and we see him face to face in heavenly glory. Amen.